and she's crawling through these uh, tight passages and finally emerges on a ledge inside a large, seemingly bottomless cavern. And as she looks across the chasm or cavern, she sees another ledge lower down that leads to an entrance in this far wall further away. And as she looks, out emerges what she says was a group of giants, approximately 20 feet tall, with long white hair walking in a single file line along this narrow ledge. Along this narrow ledge. All right, welcome back to Blurry Creatures this week. We got another episode with Derek Olson from Megalithic Marvels. Derek's always great. We're going to talk about the elongated skulls recently discovered, and sometimes we hypothesize about newspaper articles. It's always good to talk about something that happened right here and now in the present day, present time, present age. So, yeah, feeling good. This is going to be fun. Yeah, and, you know, always, always grateful for Derek and, and, and his time and what he's doing with Megalithic Marvels and he was making the rounds too. We, we heard him on uh, on Tony's podcast, the Confessionals. We love Tony Merkel over there. Uh, also, with, well, with a friend of the show, with Kara, and let's be friends. Getting getting the information out. Uh, he's always a wealth of knowledge. And you're right. This is super fascinating. bunch mm-hmm. of de- bunch of what the media is calling deformed. We know to be elongated skulls were dug up in in a Neolithic site in Iran. And so we are jumping on that, Nate. We need Ben Tapper. Blurry on the scene. Send him to Iran. Exactly. <laughs> we talk a lot about mounds. We talk a lot about giants. We talk a lot about creatures. And, and this this just helps you put together that you can trust the weird stuff in your Bible. You can trust the weird stuff in old newspaper articles and, I guess, ancient reports as well. But Derek's a great dude, and, and he's super humble and very kind, very generous, has been pumping blurry creatures from the beginning, and a big fan of our show. Kind of a cheerleader on the sidelines, and he even wants us to go with him to Egypt. I mean, he's the Let's best. Go. Let's go. Derek, he's always got the juice. Always got the juice, Nate. So if you want to get access to some of the – we talked about some of the members' episodes on this podcast episode. If you want to become a member of the show, blurrycreatures.com slash members, become a member, help sponsor it. That's how we keep the lights on here. That's the main way that this podcast keeps going. Without you guys sponsoring the show, we couldn't spend as many hours as we do producing this. We got another interview right after this one. So we're back to back tonight, and we're spending a lot of time recording shows and trying to get at least two episodes a week right now. We've been rolling for the last couple of weeks. So, boom, that's because of you, members. Yeah. Extra episodes, extra perks. And join the community. One of the coolest things about this is the community. So we've got a pretty cool Facebook, private Facebook group. Facebook's not your thing. You have telegram and discord where we continue to discuss blurry things and all that's available um if you want to join the membership that's right and be a member yeah and as things are growing thanks for sharing with your friends giving us a rating on itunes sending us a message all the ways you inter- interact with us and sending us stories a big part of the members episodes is is you guys sharing your stories whether you've seen something had an experience so continue to send yeah. us those stories i would hit you with the little people later if you support the show Nate can pursue his ultimate dream of finding the little people out in the Appalachian Mountains. That's so right. Join up. <laughs> Help Nate. It's like it feels like make a wish. Help Nate. It's a wish come true that you can find the little people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see what Derek's up to. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. 
That's a big deal. Let's go. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back to Blurry Creatures. Derek from Megalithic Marvels. For those of you just joining in for the first time, we are a podcast about giants and creatures, Bigfoot, and all the weird stuff that's out there. And we bring on our good friend, Derek from Megalithic Marvels. Those of you guys who don't know Derek, he's got his own channel, Megalithic Marvels. He's got an awesome YouTube presence and Instagram presence, TikTok. He's all over the place talking about the antediluvians times, the pre-flood dynasties, and all the weird stuff. We've talked about that a lot. And if you're joining us and you think we're we're, we're, we're ribbing him too much during these episodes. We're, we're friends. That's why. So <laughs> we have fun on these interviews with Derek. It's not that we're unprofessional. We just like you. And we make some jokes sometimes. So, But we like to learn, too. So welcome back to Blurry Creatures, where you're always dropping some, some bombs on us and rattling our brains a little bit. And today, we're talking about the big, the big brains. Right, yeah, Luke? We are. We are. And Derek, we talked a little bit on this before we started the recording, but... If you haven't listened to Derek uh, other places, he's done some great interviews outside of Blurry Creatures catalog. Obviously, he's got his own YouTube and Instagram that are going on, but he also was on our friend Tony in the Confessionals podcast recently. And then Kara's he was too. Also on, yeah, on Let's Be Friends. So Derek is, uh, man, you are the man in demand right now. We're lucky to have you. <laughs> and uh, this is timely, I think, because, Nate, we had early on in our catalog, if, you, if you're joining us now, newly joining Blurry Creatures, we talked to Brian Forster in Peru about the Paracas skulls. And if if you are not familiar with what that is, and Derek's going to talk about it, but I would encourage you to go back into the catalog, listen to mm-hmm. that, and then c- come on back because we're kind of built, we're going to build on, on that. We've talked to Derek a bit about this as well, but I'm not going to steal his thunder at all, but there was a recent discovery. And so it, it kind of prompted me and Nate individually, not knowing to each other to reach out to Derek and, and ask him about separately his thoughts on this separately. Honestly, I was mowing my lawn thinking, listening to Derek on the confessionals and being like, dude, we got to talk about these, these, yeah, these non sagittal suture skulls that have popped up in the middle East here. I love it. Well, if we both independently have the same idea, then it's, it's got to happen. It's going to be good. Yeah, so here <laughs> we are. So welcome back, Derek. Thanks for coming on. I am honored to be back on Blurry Creatures. Uh, and yeah, it's been fun jumping on Tony's podcast, The Confessionals and, and Kara's. That was, they're great podcasts as well. And, and uh, thanks to you guys. I think uh, really started on this show. Man, you guys have just been climbing the charts. What'd you reach? Like number 53 at one point I saw on one of those charts? I think it was 55 is the highest we got. But still. Wasn't for- high enough. Come on, <laughs> keep pushing. <laughs> got to break 50. We're coming for you, Rogan. We're coming. Hey, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, you mentioned my YouTube. I put up a reel on YouTube that was from, I believe, one of our last interviews talking about lost ancient tech of Egypt. And that thing just went over a million views. And it's just a 60-second clip. But, hey, that's the power of the blur right there. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> <The blur. laughs> we thought nobody oh, would listen to this podcast, just a bunch of goofballs asking questions, trying to figure out what, what is Bigfoot. And that led us down a lot of rabbit holes. And it takes us back in time, basically, because if you want to understand what Bigfoot is, you got to go all the way back to the time when creation was corrupted and the world was a completely different place. And that's your zone, the bone zone. <laughs> the bone zone. <laughs> we are going to talk about the attack of the Coneheads. That's right. Yeah, uh, Luke, you mentioned this uh, recent um, discovery, and there's been some images going around about this the last couple of weeks, but I kind of did a deep dive and posted a video and an uh, article about this, which you can find at megalithicmarvels.com. But in short, for those who may not know, this cache of strange elongated skulls was unearthed on the Zora Plain in southwest Iran at an archaeological site. I hope I get this right. It's called Tola Chegla Sofla. Does that sound Middle East? That sounds good to me. Does sound, yeah. <laughs> we give you the blurry, the blurry stamp of approval. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a big phrase there. But so, according to recent archaeological evidence, this site it flourished around 4700 BC, so pretty old. And uh, considering the size of the residential quarter that the archaeologists unearthed, they found the number of skeletons there buried to be very high, at least 102 skeletons. And, and they think this is due to multiple burial graves being constantly used for generations. However, 
as you read the archaeologist um, original report on this, they go on to state that among other explanations to consider uh, for why there's so many dead in this area could be ritual activities, they say. Hmm. And so I wonder, is this hinting at uh, sacrifice, cannibalism, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So there was like 11 graves in total excavated. They gave them three different unit names, A, B, and C. And this is important as I get to the special part of the discovery. So there was three graves in area A, six graves in area B, one grave in area C. And based on studies, uh, it was a pretty young group that had died um, between ages six and like 40 years old. Now, here's where it gets crazy. Uh, one of the lead archaeologists, uh, his name is Abbas Maghadam, made the following statement. He said, quote, at Tolecegla Sofla, the concentration of deformed skulls in grave BG1 is striking. Mm. One example is also recovered in BG6, although the actual number might have been higher, end quote. Okay, so they find these 12 elongated skulls in this one grave alone that's dubbed BG1. And I find it really interesting that these archaeologists found the concentration of deformed skulls in this grave to be striking. Because when you read their report, they further state, well, obviously, that they found another elongated skull in this other grave. And then they say, you know, it might have even been higher, the overall number. And they go on to say in their report that you know, cradle headboarding is common throughout the Middle East, but that's why I think it's so interesting that they they seem so taken back by this discovery if they're so common, right? Right. Yeah. And then when you start to look at the photos of these elongated skulls, I think it's interesting. Uh, well, first of all, I should state, I find it interesting that all of these elongated skulls are mostly found in this one grave, not spread throughout the others in the A and C areas. And so that makes me go, hmm, were these like the ruling class at one point for this area? And then obviously, as you see in the photos, and I want to get your guys' take on it, these photos uh, definitely appear at first glance, at least some of them, to be what I would say are natural elongated skulls, meaning they possess more cranial volume than normal human skulls, at least 20% more, especially that skull number four in that picture. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Looks pretty big. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna and we're gonna put these on when this episode drops. We'll have these available on our members page for sure. So if if, if you are a member, we're gonna have all these pictures posted. If you are not, you should join. Uh, not for just for that reason, but also for a myriad of um, elongated reasons. <laughs> <laughs> what you would say the list is elongated? I would say it's, it's quite long. Yes. <laughs> no, Derek, it looks awesome. I mean, it, and we talked extensively about you know, this in the past about, you know, the sagittal suture, the size of the skulls and why they were imitating, you know, why people were, you know, cradle headboarding in the first place. So go back to some of our previous episodes and dig through that because we, we spent a good amount of time talking about they were emulating something they were seeing. That's why they were doing it. You know, they weren't just doing it for, for fun. But despite all that, you can't add more mass to a head when you, when you squeeze it down and do that process. So why do you think these skulls are not getting swept under the rug? I mean, most of the time when this stuff happens, they just disappear. Why, how, how do you think this got out? And, you know, are they letting some of this stuff come out now? Or usually these things don't make it to see the light of day. Right. Yeah. Great question. Again, when you read the reports of from the archaeologists themselves and then any other mainstream report, they're just ch chalking it all up to, um, Oh, this is just cradle headboarding that they were kind of doing in this region. But again, when you look at the photos and you look at some of these, some of these, again, to me, appear to be natural elongated skulls. They've got more cranial volume and they seem to be missing the uh, sagittal sutures that you referenced. And uh, in doing further research, I found another photo of an even older elongated skull that was unearthed in Iran at a location. I believe it's called Koga Safid. This thing is dated to around the 7th millennia BC. And this is that last picture I sent you. It's black and white, kind of going left to right, really long. Mm -hmm. Super cone head right there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you can see this skull seems to actually be missing kind of half of it from the bottom half of the skull. But man, it's long and 
looks very similar to the infamous Paracas skulls of Peru that we're going to talk about. And then you guys can see I did that side-by-side -side comparison of one of the uh, skulls found in Iran versus one of the Peru skulls. And you can see that the similarities are very apparent. I mean, so I mean, we're finding another cache of something anomalous like this, right? That that points back, you know, as you say, way back into history. You know, in Iran, we see these depictions in Egypt. We see them in the Black Sea region. We see them in Paracas. In fact, we know that by, you know, the DNA work that was done by, you know, this is Brian Forster and Ellie Marzulli in, in that group, you know, found the Paracas skulls had ancestry back to the Black Sea. You know, I know that we don't have a lot of answers for this, but what are your thoughts on 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 the concentration of these of these and the places they're at? Even if you even if you buy the the narrative, which we don't, because there's a lot of evidence saying you don't you don't it, it's it's not headboarding. But even if you do that, you still have to answer why are these particular places practicing this and what potentially we know that that headboarding happened in Peru. What are they emulating and why are they doing that, right? So I mean, maybe that's a two-part question because yeah. you can assume that people did this to emulate it in the same regions that they were occurring naturally. And so why mm -hmm. do you think we're finding them in these, in these particular places? Yeah, another great question. And let me kind of set up my answer by taking us to Peru because you referenced that and some of the great work done by Marzulli and Brian Forster. To set this up for people that kind of might be new to the subject, let me just say in the 1920s, there was this Peruvian archaeologist named uh, Julio Tello, I believe it is. He first discovered tombs in Paracas, Peru. It's on the uh, western coast there of Peru, filled with skeletons that possessed really the largest elongated skulls found on Earth to date. Uh, since then, many more uh, have been uh, discovered in the region, even into Bolivia. And these are all kind of dated between 2,000 and 3,000 years old. Uh, and obviously, the skeptics immediately always cry that these are just the result of cradle headboarding. Nothing drives me more mad when I'm posting <laughs> these photos or videos, and you just get that answer like a hundred times: cradle headboarding. Absolutely, emphatically, I would say wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, let me set set this up. Some of them are cradle headboarding, but many are not. Especially in Paracas, some are cradle headboarded, most are not. And here's what's going on. I really did a deep dive on this recently. So there's two different types of skulls found amongst the Paracas. There's the cradle headboarded skulls uh, that are elongated simply due to cranial deformation or headboarding. And if you would look at these skulls, like when I was at Peru a couple of years ago, except for the skull elongation, everything looks similar to our skulls. The eye yeah. sockets, jaw size, suture lines, the form and magnum that you mentioned, Luke, it's all the same. You can clearly see uh, at, at childhood, they were squeezing the skull to make it look long. They were emulating something else, as Nate hinted at. Mm -hmm. But then there is the skulls that we call the natural elongated skulls. And these are the ones that feature the crazy anatomical genetic differences. And I believe these were the nobles and the royalty of the Paracas culture and really wherever they were at around the world, most likely. And so on these naturally elongated skulls, this is where we see crazy stuff like these large jaw bones, eye sockets up to 50% larger than ours, missing sagittal sutures, uh, and that's the fibrous connective tissue joints between the two parietal plates that run down the back of our skulls. They mm -hmm. don't have those. And so Many of these elongated skull cranial volume is up to 25% larger. And then there's some, I, got, I sent you guys a photo of the, it's called the Changos skull. It's found at the Ica Museum. It's kind of near Paracas. That thing has at least 50% more cranial mass. Mm. And, and that, that goes back to what one of you said, cranial deformation cannot add more volume to a skull, mm. right? And the, and orbit, it, the orbits, the orbital holes are, are, are massive on this thing too. It doesn't, you know, I, I know why people like to, to jump to this alien thing right away with this because it's very much odd and the eyes are, are way bigger than, you know, than it's ours. like Gollum. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's really, in these pictures, again, we'll post these pictures in, in, in our members Facebook page and our channels. Yeah. So you can take a look as, and follow along here, but I want you to listen to what Derek just said one more time is that it doesn't matter how, how you, shape an infant's head and, and cradle board it you can't add any more mass you can't add bone and bone yeah, mass I, and, you, yeah. and you can't move 
genetic features like a form of magnum or, or sagittal suture. I want to ask about in Peru spe- specifically, maybe the other places as well. Is it fair to say that like when you find the, the headboarded skulls or the emulating skulls, that was it, those people have a different lineage? Like, is it the Inca that were maybe the native Incas that were actually emulating? And yet, and yet we know for a fact now that the elongated skulls of the ruling class, the ruling class actually trace their genetics back to the Black Sea. Now, of course, there's intermingling here, but like, mm-hmm. is it safe to say that like we're looking at a different race? Yes, I think so. Because when you look at, if you had a one of these naturally elongated skulls in your hand and you turned it over, you'd see on the left and right sides of the back of the naturally elongated skulls of Prochus are these strange little small bones that are interwoven into the main plates. And our skulls don't have these. This is kind of one of the interesting things I've learned of late. These small bones are known as Inca bones because they're found in the skulls of what is considered the royal Inca who lived in the 13th century. And most of them had these elongated skulls, I believe. And so I think this links the Paracas, who died out 2,000 years ago, with the rise of the Inca culture and the royal Inca were, were said to have possessed dark red hair as well. Mm. So I think that's part of the answer is I think originally they did come from the Black Sea, and we'll get into this more in a second, and then they migrated to Paracas. And then as the Paracas were dying out, uh, they moved up kind of northeast to Cusco and where the Inca really uh, thrived. Another crazy genetic piece we got to talk about because you brought the up, Luke, the form and magnum. This is the hole in the bottom of our skulls where the neck attaches. And it's located at the balance point in the center bottom of a normal skull. If you looked at an x-ray, right in the center bottom of a normal skull is the hole where the neck would come in. But on the naturally elongated skulls of the of Prochus, it's located this hole way to the back bottom of the skull. This is 100% genetic because you cannot change the location of the form and magnum by head binding because you would kill the infant or the child by doing so. Basically uh-huh. suffocate them and talk about needing um, an adjustment from your chiropractor, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, and to me, the real smoking gun in all of this within the past five years, and I sent you guys a picture about this, there have been even more discoveries of these elongated skulls unearthed in Peru and Bolivia of newborn infants Mm. right out of the womb with massive elongated skulls. And you guys can see that one. It looks like it was a newborn. If it, if literally it didn't die in the womb, it's got the biggest elongated skull by proportion. I think that I've seen, and you can see the arrows are pointing to the eyes because it's so big. You can't hardly make out where they are. It makes you think about when we interviewed Dr. Jeff Meldrum a little bit, Luke. If you spend your whole time looking at feet, right, when it comes to Bigfoot, like you have these casts, these prints, and he was trying to say to to his professionals who said these are fake footprints or misidentification, he's like saying, I spend my whole time looking at casts, and I know foot morphology better than anybody in the world. It's not fake. It's not It's not a fake thing. So I think on the, the casual listener, the casual YouTuber is going to look at these and go, yeah, it's just, that's how they did, that. that's what they did back then. But if you're somebody who actually spends a little more time and you look into it and you know the history, these things are, they stand out to you. And we've talked about this a lot on our show and it's, it's, I, I can get, I understand why it's frustrating to you because you're like, I spent all my time. I wouldn't post this if it was just a simple thing, a simple answer like that. I w- it wouldn't even go on my channels because I'm, so what? There's a thousand channels are posting this, these things. These are different. This is an outlier. So that's why I'm posting it. And then people just, I don't know why they don't understand these simple things, but we run channels, so we get it. But Derek, do you think that, is this, did all giants have these, these heads like this? Or was it just like, sounds like they were, you know, concerned about royalty. Were they inbreeding a lot? And that was kind of what created this, these deformities or do they all look weird like this? Or was that like something that, that happened, do you think over time? Or I'm just curious. Yeah, and I'll get into this more uh, in a little bit, but I theorize that most of these naturally elongated skulls found around the world, whether it's Peru, whether it's uh, Egypt, we'll talk about Malta, we're going to talk about even in North America, these are found all over. I theorize that they represent a race of these hybrid humanoids that basically descended from the Nephilim or the Rephaim tribes of Canaan that Genesis 14 and Deuteronomy 2 talk about. I'm going to share a scripture later on 
that might hint, um, how do I say it? Maybe why some of them had elongated skulls. Mm. And uh, again, so I have some theories about why they had these, but I want to save that for the end to keep our listeners on board. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. You're always you're always dangling the carrot, teasing. <laughs> so, oh, one other thing I got to mention, you guys mentioned DNA and, and Black Sea stuff. So yeah, Brian Forster, LMR, Julie, they, they did extensive research about the DNA, spent a ton of money, waited over five years to get the results, which finally legitimately came back really within the last couple of years. They sent them to different labs. One of those was UCLA. I think they sent 18 skulls. Results came back on 12 of them. In a nutshell, in four of the skulls, there was you know what they call Native American ancestry with the haplogroups, but no Native American ancestry was found in the others, in the other eight. And the other eight traced their ancestry to the Caspian and Black Sea near Crimea. And again, uh, Brian Forster theorizes that, you know, some 3,000 years ago, the ancestors of the Paracas, they fled the Black Sea area for some reason, headed south through Iraq and Iran to the Persian Gulf and sailed east to the coast of, of Peru. A little crazy factoid, obviously, Paracas, Peru is the number one location where the largest elongated skulls on Earth are found. But can you get guys guess where uh, which location comes in second for the largest collection of elongated skulls? Oh, wow. it's kind of a it's kind of a, a re- it's not really a trick question. <laughs> the answer is Crimea. So it, may, it shows the the natural connection there, right? Where you've got Peru, largest collection in the world of elongated skulls. Second uh, largest location, according to Brian Forster, is the Black Sea, which looks like that's where they came from. So there is this obvious connection. And we see that they were migrating to two different sides of the earth. Mm. Now let's talk about another location. Some people might not have heard about where these elongated skulls have been found. And that's on a little island called Malta. And this island is kind of like Sardinia, very mysterious, very, I mean, a, a prehistoric civilization totally thrived here. There's megalithic sites all over the island. But the most fascinating site of all is subterranean. It's underground. And I sent you guys a picture of from the early 1900s when the first archaeologist discovered this, I believe, in 1902. It's uh, known as the Hypogeum Hall Soflini. And this thing was cut straight out of the limestone bedrock. Now, limestone is way softer than granite. So this thing is definitely weathered from the ages, as are all the megaliths there, because Again, if it was granite, they'd look like they were probably in Peru, but they were limestone, so it just erodes quicker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this this subterranean chamber goes down three levels, mm. and you can see that main chamber. It's got these amazing megalithic trilophon beams, and that's where they found the strange statue of the sleeping lady. And then you go down a level, I believe, and you you go to what's called the oracle chamber. And again, this is kind of setting up where I think one of the purposes of these elongated skulls come from. So you go down to the Oracle Chamber, which is proven to have acoustic properties and resonance. It's been extensively studied by researchers. Basically, anything spoken in this chamber, they call it the Oracle, it echoes throughout this whole hypogeum. I read that research done by the University of Siena showed that the construction of the chamber was made in a way to affect the psyche of the ancients. Wow. And yeah, and 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 even the mainstream uh, archaeologists theorize that this was likely a place where the priests this, uh, of these elongated skull peoples would produce sounds that they believed would enhance their strange rituals. Mm. Mm. So this place is very mysterious, but it gets level because if you go 36 feet below street level, you hit level three, which is closed to the public. Wow. So... The original archaeologist, his last name is Zamit, I believe. He discovered upon discovery of this site, I believe, in 1902. Check this out. 7,000 plus skeletons piled within the various chambers. And he described the skulls as, quote, of the long variety, end quote. Wow. Now, I've searched far and wide to try to find photos of, of these elongated skulls. And there's some you can find, but they they don't look elongated like the archaeologist states. Mm. 
And so uh, I kind of think there's a definite cover up. But just like the Paracas skulls, the original archaeologists and researchers said they were all missing, again, the sagittal sutures. So, again, a genetic anomaly, right? Yeah. Wow. And uh, in, in the mid-80s, they were removed from public display by Heritage, Mal Heritage Malta, which is the authority there. And so, again, they were never seen in public, again, kind of like the Lovelock skulls. Sounds very familiar. And, yeah. And uh, while people say they've all been dis destroyed or disappeared, Heritage Malta says they're available for scientific research only. But literally hardly anyone has seen these. But there was a guy named Dr. Mifsud, I believe. He published some articles because he got he was one of the few that got to go see these and go into the chamber, I believe, and inspect these skulls. And he wrote a paper on the elongation I was reading through, and he confirmed the craniums were naturally long and not a result of head binding. Mm. And he went on in his publication to draw parallels to the Egyptian culture and their so-called serpent priests. Huh? And another nugget, in 1920, National Geographic magazine reported uh, that the first inhabitants of Malta were a race of elongated skulls. Wow. And I want to hear your thoughts on that. But before we move on, I want to make sure you know I've got a cool story to share about this hypogeum after that. There's a lot in common when you look at Sardinia, Malta, and Crimea. They're all very similar in terms of like kind of their landscape. There were remote places where these things probably ended up at. And I wonder, I, I think I asked you this on our last episode, but it seems as though there were some genetic anomalies to these things. Because we've talked about extensively, and I think the more you go on in these spaces, you you ask weirder questions and harder questions to try to make sense of these things. If the elongated skulls were some sort, some sort of race of giants, maybe if their father, the original, was some specific breed of angelic race, and he produced these things that had these crazier heads that, and maybe... The giants weren't, I guess you could say, some of them had elongated skulls. Maybe some of them didn't, and they maybe they fought each other. Maybe the elongated skulls moved to certain parts of the world. When we turn over these stones, it, it's not as easy as good versus evil. You know, there's many factions of these of these empires. And I'm just always wondering, like, what the world looked like back then, and if these elongated skulls fought some other tribes of giants, and there wasn't harmony. It, it just makes you wonder, because they're always found in very specific places where it seems like they weren't liked, so they moved to this area. Yeah, no, on that thought, and remind me to go back to the hypogeum when I'm done with this, because I got a really cool story. Yeah, I've shared this Josephus quote before on one of our shows. Josephus was a first century Roman Jewish scholar, historian, wrote some important books. One was the Antiquities of the Jews, where he talks about giants. And this is one of my favorite quotes from a non-biblical source. Quote, he says, there were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day. End quote. So we learned several things from this amazing quote. One is this, uh, this guy living in, I think, about 100 AD was saying that in his day, the bones of these giants were still on public display that they had huge bodies, they had countenances entirely different than other men, that they were surprising to the sight. And the big key I want to focus on here is terrible to the hearing. Yeah. Is, is Josephus hinting at sound frequencies that these things could make? And that, that kind of takes me back to, you know, John 1.1 1, 1 talks about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. Genesis 1, obviously, God spoke and created everything, right? Mm -hmm. And then we got Joshua 6. Uh, Josh, God's telling Joshua to have Israel walk around the megalithic walls of Jericho once a day for six days. On the seventh day, God says, march around the city seven times with priests blowing the trumpets, right? And when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout and the wall, the walls will collapse. And so the point is that, you know, in a nutshell, the, Israel brought down these, these massive impenetrable walls uh, by using mm. sound waves. Mm -hmm. And then the very first letter of uh, the Hebrew 
the very first Hebrew letter, I believe, is Aleph. And it, it, if you study it, it's like an outbreath. It's a sound. And the sound is, is the expression from the divine source, which then manifests in the material world. So the point is I'm hitting on sound, I'm hitting on resonance, right? And then if you look at you know the crazy works of, of Tesla, he basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, you have to think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Mm. So then we got that Josephus quote talking about they were terrible to the hearing. Mm-hmm. And that kind of takes me, you know, were these were these ancient humanoids, whether they, whether they were the giant flavor, uh, i.e. Goliath, or these Paracas humanoids that were smallish but had these huge elongated skulls. Either way, they were genetic anomalies. And is you know, did they move and shape the megaliths using sound resonance and frequencies? basically on a level that we could never achieve. And were the elongated skulls a part of that? You know, did they have telepathic abilities? And another scripture that might hint at this, Deuteronomy 2.20. Let me set this up. So the word Rephaim, right? It, I think it's first recorded in Genesis 14, war against the giants. So Rephaim is the male plural form of the Hebrew word Rapha, which means giant or a tribe of giants. So these giants are illegally squatting in the covenant land previous to Abraham settling there. So Genesis 14 and Deuteronomy 2 basically mention several of these humanoid type uh, Rephaim or Nephilim tribes. You've got the uh, Zuzim, which Uh the Hebrew word is roving creatures. You got the, I think it's the Amim, the Hebrew word there is terrors, the horim, cave dwellers. There's your cave, Nate. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the Zamzumim, which I want to focus on for a second. They're called plotters. And so when you read Deuteronomy 2.20, it says this, that was also regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonites called them the Zamzumim a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. Okay, so Zamzumim, one of the words for them is plotters. If you look at the Arabic translation, like on the concordance, it says that they talk gibberish. Okay, this kind of, again, lends me back to Josephus's quote, right? They were strange to the hearing. So they talk gibberish. The Hebrew lexicon describes them Check this out. As a nation of giants dwelling within the borders of the Ammonites before Moses, a tribe making noise. A tribe making noise. A tribe making noise. A tribe making So again, I theorize, are are these natural elongated skulls found around the world? Do they represent a race of hybrid humanoids that descended from these Rephaim tribes? Did they have these supernatural abilities in part due to their elongated skulls? Is that why the cradle headboarded skulls, meaning the normal humans, were emulating the naturally elongated skull peoples because they knew they had like these supernatural powers, these extrasensory means and they wanted to be like them. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I originally I'm thinking about the intro to our show when it talks when we have a, we have the Bigfoot sound effect, and it sounds like the gibberish. It sounds like this crazy chatter, samurai chatter, and the Bigfoot creature has this weird, <laughs> this weird language almost, right? Get some of the Bigfoot creatures get up to nine foot, maybe even bigger. So it makes me think of. That's where our show originated when we interviewed Ron Moorhead and we talked about his experience in the, uh, you know, in California when he was, you know, going through there. And they, at night, these creatures were talking to each other and he's recording it. And it's just this strange chatter. But also, whenever, when people hear the Bigfoot communicating, it's, it's sort of bellows in your chest. It's, it's, it's intimidating. So, and that's like some of the best 
sort of you know evidence we have in modern times of some some creatures like this that have that. And if Bigfoot comes from some sort of giant mixture, Nephilim mixture, it would make sense that they would emulate some of those characteristics. So that that's my initial thought is, you know, some of these tribes maybe they didn't speak the same language. Maybe they were at war with each other. Maybe they did have different you know, anomalies, and it was probably more Lord of the Rings-esque than just humans versus giants, an easy answer. So the the Bigfoot chatter is weird, and I wonder if that's related. Yeah, very interesting. And then when you think about, you know, again, like the megaliths that I've seen in, in Peru and especially Egypt on this last trip, there's it's it's all surrounding acoustics and, and vibration. And, and we know, you know, basically that resonance is like a phenomenon of vibration. Sound is perhaps one of the most powerful manifestations of energy. So ultimately, sound is like a vibration brought into an audible range. And when you go into the megalithic chambers uh, in the pyramids and in these megalithic temples, you see that these chambers were designed with the right dimensions to reflect what's called the standing wave or frequency of sound wave, which you can identify by humming a note. And that's exactly what was happening in this hypogeum at this this room called the Oracle. Sorry, Luke, were you going to say something? No, I was just, I wanted to, to sort of capitalize and hit on what you were saying, because I, I think it's worth repeating and worth sort of, you know, hypothesizing that that we know based on on our our way of doing things and and we consider ourselves modern humans the way we do things we know we go back to Egypt we know that all of these things these these lifting of rocks these moving of granite this moving of you know thousand ton multi thousand ton rocks and we know that with with modern truckloads of moving debris and how long these things particularly had to take, and, and yet the history books say that, that these things were built in you know thirty years. So, this, so we have this an anomalous construction that we can't repeat. We can't figure out how they did it. And then you, I thought it was fascinating. To th- we're talking about like how just now science is figuring out you can levitate things with sound. I mean, they do little experiments with this, right? They levitate little blocks and, and using high frequency of sound. And I think about the cyclopean walls or these hexagonal or polygonal, sorry, polygonal walls we see in Peru. We see in all these megaliths. You talk about this often. And I think it's fascinating to relate those to being seismic proof, right? And we know that that seismic activity deals with vibrations of, of the earth, right? And so somehow the ancients, this is very, I mean, this is factual. We, Knowledge they built earthquake proof walls somehow, and I think I think the sound aspect is interesting, especially considering, you know, it could be it could just be that they were horrific beings that made loud, really awful noises. But I think that's probably a very rudimentary understanding of that, considering what you're talking about with Jericho in the biblical in the, in the biblical text and what happened there. And I think it was interesting the the Aleph things fasting, the idea that God breathed life into us, and that is the first you know the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and God is the Alpha and Omega. And, you know, the, the text says that God breathed, breathed things, spoke things into existence. Those are all just amazing things. I know you have a story for us about the, the, the multi-hypernium, but I want to point one thing out. And I, I, I think this is for me, for dummies like me, if you haven't looked, every, listeners, if you haven't looked at where the Black Sea is, I think in my head, I, I was thinking it stuck in the middle of Russia, like the Caspian Sea, for, for whatever reason. That's kind of what I thought. So... Uh, you know, as Derek speaking, I'm pulling this up and realizing just how very close this is in proximity to the Middle East. It, it, it's on the up. It, it borders the northern region of Turkey, right? And, and we've on this show, Nate and, and Derek talked about Gebekli Tepe, and, and we are going to have an episode at some point about Kahar and Tepe. These ancient, ancient megalithic cities that appeared out of nowhere don't fit in the right timeline because we were supposed to be a bunch of hunter gatherers, and they're these very religious oriented stone circle megalith cities that some have hy- hypothesized could be the temples of the watchers so it's because technology springs out of nowhere right and if we are to look at the conquest of joshua as well and you pinpoint these things derek and where these where these elongated skulls are found and you look at at the black sea you know you go north to turkey from the holy land you go to iran you go east from the holy land 
Um, there's a diaspora here. Even if you look at where Malta is, it's across the Mediterranean, you know, west of the Holy Land, and Cairo is right there. So you have this proximity, and I don't, I don't think I really grasped how close these things were. Mm-hmm. This kind of fits with the diaspora of tribes of Canaan. And if we're to hypothesize that somehow these anomalous skulls that don't seem quite human could have could have possibly come from the Gen 6 event down the line at some point. We don't believe for sure these were giants, per se. They maybe they could have been on, on, at some level, but they just seem to have giant skulls. So wherever this fits in that, the spreading out and the co-location of these places with skulls does sort of look like a diaspora from... The Holy Land. I know that people spread out anyway, so that you can also say that. But it's fascinating to me that you have these epicenters of, of civilizations we know right now. We'll, we'll probably find stuff that's older at some point. The Sphinx, by the way, we talked about is hypothesis as way older than that. That you have these these places that seem to fit right in. And this is, we we Nate, we talk about the Bible here as, as the place and the foundation for the things we want to want to understand, the weird we want to understand. And it does seem to fit really in, into the into that the spreading of of weird beings from. The promised land, as Joshua was, as God passed judgment, and Joshua and the tribes of Israel pushed pushed the giants and tribes of giants and and hybrids and everything else out of the promised land. I just I think it's interesting, and if you haven't if you're listening and haven't had a chance just to Google map this, I just think I was pretty good at geography. I think I still think I'm pretty good, but I I, <laughs> I was thinking Caspian Sea, Derek, and, and like in the middle of Russia, being like, how does this all fit together? Really, it's right there. It's there. It's just mm-hmm. north of Turkey. And it's easy to see how these things all could have migrated. These yeah, that's a that's hybrids. a great point. Yeah, definitely uh, Google Earth that stuff to kind of give yourself a visual, like like Lucas saying of if this started in Canaan and these other locations we're talking about how they might have dispersed. And then another thing to answer your question, Nate. Yes, I do. I would hypothesize that some of these giants, whether it's a Goliath or whatnot, one of these giants mentioned in the Old Testament. Definitely, I believe some of them had elongated skulls. And one photo to kind of give you a visual I sent you, I think it's from it's a digital recreation of, of Simar Studios. They've worked with Brian Forster in kind of recreating what these uh, hybrids would have looked like alive. You've got one that's a giant standing next to what would be a six foot guy. And you can see what, <laughs> how crazy that looks, uh, you know, an eight foot. 10 foot tall giant with this elongated skull. So that's a great visual. You guys might want to throw that up somewhere. And then, and then they've, they've recreated what a Paracas ancient humanoid might've looked like. And that's a lot different. You see this huge elongated skull, right? On this being that kind of has this skinny neck and uh, smallish shoulders. So again, I believe these are just different, I don't know if you want to call them tribes, but they're just different descendants um, with these different anatomical genetic differences. But I want to get back to the story at the Hypogeum, and then I'd love to chat about Akhenaten just for a couple minutes to tie in the Egypt side of all this, which is pretty crazy. So again, this Hypogeum in Malta, it's so amazing because again, we're talking megalithic, a megalithic marvel, but it's the best of both worlds. We've got elongated skull discoveries inside this thing. And then we've got some strange disappearances inside this, this oh. structure. And uh, I know on our on doing shows like this, we like to share some stories. So as I stated earlier, there's this third level in this subterranean hypogeum. It's today sealed off to the public because long ago, uh, people went down inside and never returned. And there's some decently legit sources about this. The first one, National Geographic Magazine, August 1940. It's titled Wanders a Wheel in Malta. And it says prehistoric man built temples in chambers in these vaults. It's talking about the hypogeum. In a pit beside one sacrificial altar lie thousands of human skeletons. It goes on to talk about how there's a honeycomb network of these underground passages and catacombs. And years ago, it says one could walk around underground from one end of Malta to the other. But all entrances were closed by the government because of a tragedy. And then it says this, on a sightseeing trip comparable to a nature study tour in our own schools, a number of elementary school children and their teachers descended into the tunneled maze and did not return. 
For weeks, mothers declared that they had heard wailing and screaming from underground, but numerous excavations and searching parties brought no trace of the lost souls. After three weeks, they were finally given up for dead. Man, that's, that's sad. Like polite stuff, man. Pretty intense uh, disappearance there, but then it gets even crazier. We can't we can't leave Malta without talking about megaliths, humanoids, elongated skulls, disappearances, and giants. Mm. Mm. We we got a giant giant tail here for you guys, and this is coming from it was called the Borderland Science Magazine, published 1958, and the title of this article is Malta Entrance to the Cavern World. And this article is about a British government employee, I believe, by the name of Luis Jessup, who in the 1930s visits Malta, and she wants to see the hypogeum. And she uh, pays a tour guide. They go in with you know, like candlelight. He can, uh, she can, she basically begs if she can go down to this third level, this off area level. And he allows her to go go down there, but it's at her own risk. And so with a lighted candle, she descends down to the third level and she's crawling through these uh, tight passages and finally emerges on a ledge inside a large, seemingly bottomless cavern. And as she looks across the chasm or cavern, she sees another ledge lower down that leads to an entrance in this far wall further away. And as she looks, out emerges what she says was a group of giants, approximately 20 feet tall, with long white hair walking in a single file line along this narrow ledge. And she basically freaked out and got out of there. But there we have a giant sighting in Malta at the Hypogeum. What do you guys think? Wow, wow. I mean, we're starting, Derek, to get a few emails from people who spotted these present day. And we're trying to track them down and bring them on the show and have their encounter stories. But the best sort of clue we have towards an, a modern day Nephilim story, besides the, you know, Kandahar giant, which is what everyone talks about. A couple guys were out and they and they said this thing kind of yelled at them and they and it was very the sound was the most terrifying thing when this when they spotted this thing. They they they're estimating fourteen the sound. Yeah, exactly. The fourteen fifteen foot creature that they encountered was different than a bigfoot creature. And see, one thing I I love about our episodes, Derek, and I really want to give this to listeners is that like the ancient world is, you know, we talk about all kinds of creatures on our show, and some people just are, are very highly skeptical. Well, you paint an ancient world where. You had, cy- you had the Cyclops building specific things, right? You had the elongated skulls over here doing this thing. You had dynasties like Atlantis where they seemed like the, the Greek gods, which they, you know, huge, like probably very attractive, you know, s- seducing people to come to these, uh, these build these empires. And it was very uh, geometrical in the way they built. And then you have sort of these giants that sound like cavemen living in the caves, not like the Atlantis giant. So the ancient world is cr- is crazy. And I wanted to ask you, do you see architecture that would, this is my hypothesis, that would support some of these things where they're building, they have different technologies and they're building things, say some of these guys are good at this part or this guy, you know, the Cyclops is good at, at doing it this way. Do you see sort of a difference around the world where maybe some of these tribes were building differently but it's still immaculate and it's still amazing. It's still complex, but it's just, it's not the same formula. It's not the same recipe. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've hit on this before, like you said, in another show, but I definitely think in Peru, you've got these precision megalithic walls. Uh, I'm thinking of you know, like Machu Picchu, Ojante Tambo, precision, just beautiful megalithic walls, intricate you even see some of those in Greece. Uh, I think there's a site called Keramikos. Incredible. Some of the most incredible megalithic architecture I've ever seen right there in Greece. Most people have never heard of it. I've got some photos of that on the Megalithic Marvels Instagram, Keramikos, Greece. So it's just this intricate, precision, beautiful uh, megalithic architecture. And then you've got the, uh, the Cyclopean style, which... 
you see at different sites like uh, Mycenae in Greece and uh, Alatri in Italy, I believe. But these are just kind of not, I don't want to say crude, but just, I like to use the word, even though it's not really a word, megaton uh, interlocking blocks, not in the beautiful pristine way, mm-hmm. but more in a brutish, like literally like a giant 12 foot Cyclops came through and was just hucking these things <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love and it. Then you, and then you've got the hypogene that we've been talking about, which you look at it, this is megalithic. It's got these trilophon like beam pieces that look very megalithic, but this thing is uh, more smallish for this. Uh, I don't want to say dwarf, but the smallest race of people that were probably four feet tall. Uh, yet they had this knowledge to carve this out of pure limestone with acoustic chambers. So they had some kind of special, I believe, technology and knowledge to do this. Yeah, I love it. And that's and and that's kind of what we do on our show is try to give people a framework to understand all the weird creatures people still see today, right? And so we're setting up an ancient world that could have where almost anything's possible. Like you were just talking about the little people. And people come on our show and say they see these things. They're like gnomes or they're little Native Americans. And, like, and the th- people have to have some sort of context to make sense of these sightings. I think some people just like to get weird and they stay in the Bigfoot realm. But Bigfoot is just one of many. And I love, I love, I love going back in time and setting up this, this, it's like, it's like this history of, you know, thousands of different anomalies. And then it just trickles down throughout, you know, throughout time. And we still have some remnants of them, whether it's Nephilim, little people, giants, Bigfoot, all this stuff kind of comes back and people still have sightings and see these things. You know, it was impressive on me, Nate, that we were talking about this and I hadn't, I I think in some ways when we talk about hybrids or we talk about you know the angelic mixing of of races in gen six i think we're often get like very monolithic in our thinking of 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 the angelic race and and i'm reminded that there is a very big variety when you talk about the angels and the cherubim and seraphim and then you have the creatures that and the angelic things that that john describes in revelation and i think we often start thinking about in a medieval way the angels all look the same And, and as i'm kind of just listening to you guys to you talk about this it impressed by me that, that perhaps the hybrids of of different angels would have looked differently there's a special variety when we're talking about you know spiritual creatures or, or things that exist in the spiritual realm or even an angelic race and so i'm just listening and, and thinking that like perhaps he's they had different offspring you have different types of angels and maybe just their job wasn't they weren't all just the same looking with different jobs that could have been perhaps the way it is but maybe they were different looking you know, of the angelic race that did different jobs, watcher angel class, a different job than, than the cherubim that, that guarded the garden and, and so on and so forth. But perhaps they would have had different looking offspring. And so perhaps some of the genetic mixing and experiments that we see, you know, gen six and post, even with the Rephaim, we could have had different variations and different looking, you know, hybrid humanoids because their fathers and mothers were different types of spiritual beings I, it just is kind of impressed upon me nate that like yeah at least for me sometimes i think monolithically that like you just get the same result you get an angel and a human you get a giant you get a giant you get a giant but yeah we're even told by the bible that there's different types of angels that look differently and do different jobs and their kids look different man look at, well I mean, look at the human race you know so well said yeah it's 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 and after, you know you do this five or six episodes you start to ask the you get get into the weirder ideas and the philosophies but what's interesting to me Luke and Derek is that they don't thrive though because they're not human right so they all meet their sticky end somehow which which helps support the biblical narrative if these things were anomalous if they were smart and they were intelligent how come they die out how come they go they get wiped out because they weren't ordained by God to be here so they couldn't really survive ever and doesn't matter what it is I mean there's little pockets here and there but they don't thrive human beings thrive even even though it sounds like we're the dumber the dumber of the two, you know, it's interesting though that they didn't have God's blessing, so they didn't. No matter how they tried, no matter what they tried to build, what empire they tried to create, it all met with demise, which I think is proof that. Well, the, the, I mean, isn't that the the picture though of of counterfeiting the things of God? Exactly. 
that you cannot create. God is the, the lone creator. And all, but, the dark, all the darkness does is counterfeit, and it's a, it's a bad counterfeit. And doesn't it can't even make it. Yeah. No, that's well said by both of you two. Look at you guys. Yeah. You, here you guys, you, got, you guys kind of play yourself off of these self-deprecating dummies, but look at these two brilliant minds going at it right here. Don't make our heads elongated here. <laughs> 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 elongating so, uh, Luke's ego. Uh, and, and to to um, <laughs> solidify your points there, um, maybe this is why we see these elongated skull humanoids hiding underground in the subterranean chamber, right? What are they hiding from? Or is it because of you know astronomical cataclysms that are happening? But then again, back to those scriptures I shared, I think from Genesis 14, Deuteronomy 2, I think we get hints again, the zuzims. It means roving creatures. It's like they're on the run. Mm -hmm. We get the horim, cave dwellers. These guys are hiding out. And so we get some different hints. I want to bring up, Luke, you mentioned serpentine features. Um, so I got to talk about Akagnaton because yeah. he's a guy that many say has serpentine features. So Akagnaton, he uh, was a, the, in the New Kingdom period, they call it the 18th dynasty. So he would be one of these dynastic Egyptians we talk about. He began his reign, I think about uh, 13,000, 1,351 BC. And he ruled for 17 years. And he's basically the infamous pharaoh. If you study the dynastic pharaohs, he's the infamous pharaoh because he made these radical changes to the traditional ancient Egyptian polytheistic religions. Egypt always worshipped all these gods. Instead of believing in many gods, when he came to rule, he enforced only worship to one god ca called Aten, uh, who was the, known as the power behind the solar disk. And therefore, he went to war against the high priests of Ra, and he became known as the heretic pharaoh by basically instigating all these major changes in Egyptian religion and art. The crazy thing is, I was in Egypt in February, went to the Cairo Museum, and there's a whole section kind of dedicated to Akhenaten and his family. And you look at these statues and these inscriptions, and it's wild because Akhenaten, his wife Nefertiti, and their daughters, six daughters, they all possess these strange gen genetic features, which include, and I see you guys a bunch of pictures there. I'd love to know your thoughts. They include these long, thin necks, uh, large, like thigh legs, extended chins, really high cheekbones, bellies, elongated conical skulls, and serpentine looking eyes, like really sl these slits for eyes, which is not normally depicted in you know, Egypt with the other pharaohs. And so why does Akhenaten and Nefertiti look so much different than all the other ancient Egyptian kings and queens? And, you know, Egyptologists, we love them. They reject even the possibility, not of naturally elongated skulls, but they even reject the idea for the most part of that they were head binding their skulls. And they basically say, oh, the Akhenaten's this poor family was just suffering from a, a strange medical syndrome or disease. And they, they use various, you know, like diseases you've never heard of to explain, explain all these strange features. So uh, to me, again, Akhenaten is so mysterious. So I theorize, was he one of these Rephaim descendants, a hybrid humanoid that literally took the throne? And does this explain why he, all of a sudden he wanted to change all of this Egyptian history overnight and literally go to war with everybody. And then when you look at after he died, Egypt basically scrubbed him from everything. Mm. It makes a lot of sense, Derek. And I like, you know, the, the, the beauty of like more being in the creature zone is we can get weird. You know what I mean? Like, and I understand, I understand that, you know, you're looking at more of the architecture and the, the megalithic, days but like we brought on a guy who went down in the deep underground military bases recently on one of our members episodes and it was so heavy what he was describing he couldn't finish the interview he just he had to leave and he and he quit but he was talking about these insectolin type creatures down below and he says they're all at war with each other 
And it's it's a familiar theme. You got underground, you got weird looking creatures, and you have no harmony between these factions and these empires, which is just which to me gives some credence to the things that you're describing that happened long ago. But this is more of a modern day phenomenon. And it also reminds me of some of the things Luke was saying about how these creatures, these angelic realms could be just like humans. Some of them are some of them have giant noses, some of them have big ears, some of them have long feet, who knows, whatever. Some of them could be multiple colors i don't know and but we interview we can bring those stranger stranger stories on our podcast and we can share them with you and you can share your findings with us and we can try to put all these pieces together because that's what we're trying to do is just make sense of what's going on because people see weird things and then they go to ancient aliens and they try to find answers there and and when they can go to their bible and they can find answers you're looking in deuteronomy you're pulling these things out look at these ones are on the run, these guys are in the caves. These guys are over here, but it's in your Bible. You don't have to get. You don't have to look too far from, from, from the pews. But for some reason, churches just—it's like they skip over it. So people they find podcasts and people that are willing to talk about this stuff. But it. But people come on our show and 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 sort of they hammer home some of the ideas that you're saying in different ways. But it's all lining up. That's what I'm trying to say. Boy, I'm somehow gonna have to get a copy of this members only episode. We'll put you on sounds the intense. We'll put you on the feed, baby. If yeah, the guest will. couldn't finish it, I gotta hear this. Yeah, it's wild, I, dude. I think I think too, Derek. I, I'm reminded, you know, by an episode that we did. I think it was with Brian Godawa. We were talking about Egypt and remembering that, like, the Bible is very explicit that that Yahweh is is going to pass judgment upon the gods of Egypt, right? And it's very easy just to say, oh yeah, you know, this is. They worship false gods and statues and idols, but I'm reminded that like when Moses does, you know, it does these miracles to prove God's superiority, that the magicians are able to do a few of these things, right? Like the gods have some power. And then you go back to De- Deuteronomy 32 and realize that the nations were divided and God took Israel and Yahweh took Israel unto himself. And then you start thinking about the idea that like if we're to, to hypothesize these are these are hybrids that... These were real entities that 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 were over Egypt. These were Elohim, as as they are they are in the Deuteronomy thirty two worldview, as the Bible describes them, and and in the Divine Council worldview with Mike Heiser. These all these are the the lower G gods are real entities that that are given dominion over over parts of the earth. And I don't think it's a far fetched to think that maybe they had offspring, and these offspring had were the ruling class of Egypt, just just like we talk about the men of great renown, the Nephilim, right? These were these demigods, and perhaps they had elongated skulls. I I, I think if we're going to look at things through a biblical worldview and look at the fact that these these things were given dominion, these entities, these lo, these these lower gods, and and they ruled over Egypt, and Yahweh showed his his power, and he pa- and he passed judgment, and sent you know the the ten plagues of Egypt, and set his people free. It is. It seems like you could, you could easily find a space for the intermingling of, of the gods and man, like we we know happened because of the Rephaim. We know happened post flood, but also was the reason that God wiped out the earth and spared Noah, right after the golden age. So I like I like that. I just like it a lot because I think that the darkness just doesn't has a number of strategies and they continue the same strategies and and we know that happens because we can point to it in the Bible. Like you talk about the tribes in Canaan, we talk about. Goliath and his mercenary brothers, and, and King Aga Bashan. But then you have these weird things. We have these skulls we're digging up that are natural, and you and you can't find a natural reason for why these would be that way, right? And it's yeah, it's it's fascinating. I, I love this. I think this is just so timely, considering these things are are hitting the news cycle. And I, I think it's also fascinating to pull up these articles. If you have time, pull up these articles, uh, listeners, and, and and see how. They the narrative is pushed about how these are all cranial headboarding, and, and I love. I had one here, Derek, and I was just looking up, and it, and it says the archaeologists discovered enough evidence to show the skulls were deformed intentionally. In many cases, it's still caveated. They're not going to. Uh-huh. They're not saying they all. They're trying to say that's how why they all then oh and you know they they had they're much more advanced than we thought because they had this it was Neolithic and and there's but all these people are here they were deformed intentionally. In many cases, oh, so yeah. So, you're, so you're telling me there's a chance <laughs> to go back to one of uh, Nate's earlier questions that I didn't really answer on why these skulls were allowed to be 
the news was allowed to break about him. I think it's because it's in Iran and it's not in the West. It's not in America. If this was found here, you'd never hear about it. And I'll share proof with that here to close in a minute. But again, places like Iran, Peru, it's kind of the wild West where you can still hear about this stuff and see it. That's why I went to Peru to see these Paracas skulls up close. And it is something uh, to behold. But even in America, the good old US of A, guess what we have? We've got elongated skulls. I sent you guys a couple photos there of, uh, there's one photo. I know you've done a show, I think on Catalina Island before and the giant skeletons that were discovered on Catalina Island. But what a lot of people don't realize amongst those uh, supposed giant skeletons of, you know, seven to 10 feet, there was also elongated skulls found, and you can see one of them there. That's from uh, the, the Cat the, Catalina Museum. Is it the Kennewick Man? No, that's it's like a elongated skull, and it's next to another skeleton's legs. It's kind of white and hazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's from Catalina Island. And then Kennewick Man, you bring that up. Fellow researcher Mark Carpenter, I know you had him on. He did amazing research and wrote a great article. You can find it on megalithicmarvels.com about Kennewick Man. And this was something that was so intriguing to me because Kennewick Man was discovered in my home state here of Washington State yeah. back in 19, 1996, I believe. So I remember when this news was all over, you know, ancient skeleton discovered in Kennewick, Washington and and, um, you know, I didn't really follow it much because it was just chalked up to it was kind of old and that was it. And then over the years, you find out there was this huge legal battle between the Native American tribe there who said, we want to repatriate it due to NAGPRA laws, which empowers them to do that, right? And then, but the scientists, archaeologists was saying, this, this isn't Native American. This is, this is clearly different. And so there was this huge legal battle. And in the end, long story short, Kennewick Man was repatriated back to this tribe, never to be seen again. They made supposed replica of the skull. And I was actually in Kennewick last year. And I said, hey, let's go check out the, uh, this museum and see if there's anything cool about the Kennewick Man. Guess what you see? This little smallish skull. <laughs> And, and just a little plaque that it was just kind of old and, you know, it was Native American. When you actually dig and do the research like Mark did, and you find the original photos that the top-notch journalists got their hands on, Kennewick Man had a huge elongated skull. Hmm. And you guys can see how different it is. Can I put a side-by-side -side with the original <laughs> skull and the, the uh, fake one they made? Oh. What do you think about that? Look at that guy. Yeah, I mean, what do you think these some of these elongated skulls? I mean, they're probably what eight or nine footers, ten footers. Because I mean, these are. You said some of the eye sockets are twice as big, and the, I'm just assuming that they're. Because I yeah, think, on the yeah on these ones, they're not necessarily. Um, if you see them up close, like the Paraka skulls, you can see these weren't on an eight foot body. They were smaller people. I don't know about Kennewick man, but um, like the skeletons of the of the Paracas were probably you know five foot type people, but again they just had these large conehead skulls. And so Kennewick man, another crazy thing about him, if you read the article, is there's pretty strong evidence I would say that points to his right hand had six fingers. Hmm. Hmm. So here in North America and in Washington State, we have a possibly six fingered elongated skull hybrid that was unearthed that that goes back to 9000 bc so just wanted to let listeners know that these were found all over the world including in north america how crazy is that yeah and i think a lot of this stuff just got buried in vegetation grown over you know societies moved in and it's just kind of underground but I've, i think one of the reasons most people just know the pyramids in egypt is because it's a desert out there it's not going to be covered up. I mean, there's pyramids all over the world. And we were talking about doing an episode on the pyramids in China. And so not only do you find these elongated skulls all over the world, but you find pyramids all over the world. And I think a lot of stuff in like in the jungle, 
obviously. You put something in the jungle, you build something. And I mean, I, I live in Tennessee. If you don't do your yard work here, you things just grow up and it's just buried within like like six months. Imagine a couple hundred years. This stuff gets grown over. You don't see it. But we have evidence in the desert areas where these ancient societies were thriving, but then obviously became a desert. Nothing's going to grow over the pyramids in Egypt. It's just sitting out there in the sand. But all the rest of the world, people are skeptical because this stuff just gets buried, grown over, and people think it's a mountain. What's under that mountain? You have no idea. It's harder, I think, sometimes to get these ideas growing because people are like so skeptical. Ah, that, that Those schools wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be anything in America. Those mounds are, they're not that weird. It's like, well, well, how do you know? I mean, there's so many of them and some of them are huge. And But I just think sometimes history tends to support some of these ideas a little bit better than others, depending on the terrain and how things grow and Anyway, it's just the thought I had, but we're going to do an episode on the pyramids yes. in, Ch- in China, baby. That's going to be wild. And uh, yeah, I think our listeners will be blown away about what they hear about the uh, evidence for pyramids around the world that they've probably never heard of. I love it. Well, Derek, dude, thanks for coming on. Blurry Creatures, and we, we somehow got a whole episode out of these elongated skulls in Iran. And uh, I love it, man. We we go all over the place, but every episode is a little bit more clue of the ancient past and how blurry things were back in the day and, and why you can trust maybe your friend's weird story. If he tells you he saw something in modern times, because <laughs> so many people tell us no one will listen to me. And we get these emails all the time. I couldn't tell anyone. And it's sad. Because it's like they they see something, they have an experience, it doesn't matter what it is, and they they carry these burdens their whole life. And then, they, then they're like, I'm so thankful for your podcast because now I can share these stories with you. And so if nothing else, we're thankful that people can get on our show and you can come on our show and tell us weird stuff. And while you know the academics might not want to talk about it, you're welcome here on our show and we love talking about it. You know, I, would just, I would just say it's not weird either. Like, I mean, it's just it is to most it's, people. It, well, it's just counter to the counter to the mainstream narrative. I, I mean, I, I think reading that article sort of out loud, Derek, was just like sort of case in point that they have very much have a narrative they want to push, and if you look for it, it's very easy to see. I think maybe that's one of the things about it. If you've been with Nate and I on this journey long enough, you realize that there's absolutely a prevailing historical narrative that exists out there, then you and you can see it much easier when you when you understand what we believe the reasons are for them pushing it. And and I and I love that, like you said, that there are places things happen, like Peru and Iran, where they're not under the thumb per se, or not under the thumb enough that they can bury this stuff. You know, it, it can leak out, and and, and I, I I kind of think it's akin to what we saw in the late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, with with the newspaper articles where. You know, people were finding things, finding giant skeletons, and finding finding weird things, and and it wasn't swept away. Well, you know what's funny, Luke, is when when we dig through those archives, there's often like follow up articles that try to disprove it all along the way. There's fact checkers. When people these articles come out, I see them all the time. Totally. Every time there's like this wasn't you can't trust this wasn't that you know this didn't happen. The the whole challenging the narrative has been it's in, you can see it in the newspaper articles all the time. Oh, totally. Yeah. If you like, if you Google, you know, hypo GM or something, I don't know if it's called skeptoid or there's some, there's always one site that comes to the top where this one guy debunks or, you know, says he debunks every weird thing we're talking about, but yeah, anybody can go to library of and, and search for giant skeletons or elongated schools and find crazy stuff. I mean, I've got a couple of headlines here of articles I've featured. 1871 New York Times report, eight foot skeletons with filed teeth found in Virginia cave. 1885 New York Times report, eight foot skeletons found in underground vault. 1916 New York Times report, seven foot plus horned skeletons found in Pennsylvania mound. Yeah, horned elongated and it's just yeah the newspapers even talk about the weirdness of of the differences the speciation of these giants so imagine what it was like you know 
in the beginning when you actually had them all lined up, just like the, how the world had different animals in it. And now, you know, we, we've killed off most of them. And I think that's kind of what happened. Human beings eradicated a lot of the extinct animals and probably these, these races as well. Humans sort of have been given dominion and authority here. And that's something Tim Alberino really hammers home on our show. So I love how it all interweaves, all comes together. I don't know. These are just some of my thoughts and theories. But if you're not following Derek on Megalithic Marvels, at least, at least on Instagram, you're missing out on some great content. Derek is... Uh, he he's been pumping blurry creatures since the beginning, long before we even knew you. You were you were putting us on the top ten on the website. A great f- friend of the show, friend in real life. Can't wait to hang out and do some blurry excursions. Yeah, and- I wanted to just make one more point. Okay, maybe. okay. I, I think at the end of yeah, sorry, the butt in here. No problem. But I I know that you you'd asked about some of these be- some of these being giants, right? And, and a hybrid doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, an eight to ten foot giant. Although that, exactly. that seems to be the expression a lot of times and we find in the Bible it could also be some sort of other variant where we have an elite ruling class is able to rule because of their intellect or technology, technology, whether it be supernatural or not, the things they're able to do. And I kind of, kind of that's where I kind of think my mind goes with, with some of this is that that is how they maintained their control over the population of us, you know, normal sized heads <laughs> it was that they had some hybrid ability to do to do things that maybe wasn't expressed in a way that they were like you know this giant man of renowned nephilim ogre but perhaps they were this other sort of more serpentine hybrid that was able to do things with telepathy and, and sound and maybe they all could but I, I i think that was impressed upon me that like these aren't necessarily giants the ones we found because they have normal sized or potentially within the strata normal sized skeletons but they had such a high such a bizarre natural anomaly that you can't help think that there was something of the mixing of species. Yeah. I like, I love your uh, thoughts there, Luke. And again, this brings us to why were all the ancient cultures trying to emulate these elongated skull rulers by cradle headboarding? Why go through that pain and that trauma all over the world? And it kind of makes me think of, you know, just our culture today, you know, if you want to be in the mainstream, you're dressing like the mainstream. You're not saying too much crazy stuff on social media, right? Because right. you want to fit in, you want to be accepted. And to me, that's uh, likely what these ancient humans were doing. They wanted to be in. And that's why they were literally upon birth taking their children's skulls and cradle headboarding them and wrapping them and binding them to look like their elite ruling uh, masters. Yeah. I mean, that we see that we hear that in history, you know, people who immigrate to a country, put their, make their children sort of assimilate into the culture to become six more successful than they were. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't even require tribes. It's just, it's something we, we read in human history. People dress like celebrities, right? Yeah. You dress like the rock stars. You wear yeah. the the skinny jeans, or now you're wearing the '90s clothing because that's what's coming back. Are you yeah. wearing, you know, trends? Get that mullet going. I'm, I'm good with yeah. that trend. So is that, that why we're going to start to see more '90s memes? No, we're saying in the '80s. Yeah. We're just, it's it's this is like Step Brothers. We're, we're strictly Billy Joel from the '80s, right? Um, Isn't the Miami Vice kind of '90s? <laughs> that's no '84. We can, oh, okay. '84 to '89, baby. We, we do dabble. We do creep slightly into the early '90s. <laughs> you, sometimes you, you could imagine a, a giant mullet hanging off that elongated skull, though. I mean, oh, that would be the mullet of all mullets. It would be, dude. You get a lot of party in the back. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we end this show. Just, just a couple of goofballs dude we, we appreciate it man and like i said earlier go follow derek at least on instagram you're on all the social media channels youtube go to egypt with derek next year yeah my dad my dad wants to go so yeah and um, you're also selling tickets to the old the actual hands on the stones as selling well. tickets to the what you yeah. can actually put your hands on the stones and get there oh yeah 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 come with me and nate and luke i'm, I'm talking oh. in faith now and luke's dad and, yeah and ed, ed rogers <laughs> come on yeah, this May, we're going on the second annual Megalithic Marvels of Egypt tour. It's going to be epic. Uh, we're going to go see the depictions of Akhenaten there in the Cairo Museum and private tour inside the Great Pyramid for two hours all by ourselves, crawling through every passageway. Talk about resonance. You're going to feel it. 
experience it. Yeah, you can go to megalithicmarvels.com forward slash tours or DM me on Instagram or something and I can send you the info. Awesome. Man, that's a blurry invitation right there. Well, D, thanks, man. Thanks so much, brother. This is... Yeah. Uh, man, guys, congrats on the successes. And uh, yeah, you just great, great shows, man. My wife was listening earlier today. She, I'm, I'm like, is that blurry? She's like, yeah, I'm <laughs> catching up. <laughs> Let's go. I'll let you guys go. All right, Derek. Good, good to see you, bro. Thanks for being just supportive, dude. Yeah, man. We appreciate you, bro.